Welcome to e Shala lecture series in computer science. Uh, this is a course in cloud computing. Uh, we continue our discussion of virtualization in this module as well. So, the learning objectives of uh, this class will be, we will look at the methods of virtualization, the specific methods of virtualization, how to implement a CPU or hardware virtualization. Uh, we will look at one specific example of Zen, which uses, uh, which is a virtualization uh, software uh, followed by summary. So, in the last class, we looked at what is virtualizability. We saw that some uh, hardware are not virtualizable easily. There are certain uh, mechanisms or certain problems in that particular hardware um, by which we are not able to virtualize it. We looked at Pope Kohlberg uh, theorem for that and we saw that x86, x86 which is the most popular architecture I say is not virtualizable and we just briefly described the methods of virtualization. In this class, we will look at the uh, those methods how to implement and we will look at uh, how Zen works. So, we saw that there are three techniques emulation, trap and emulate and binary translation. Let us look at a uh, little detail of how these work. So, uh, in emulation as the name suggests, use the VMM will behave like a uh, like the other expected guest OS. So, uh, here we run our uh, guest OS and the application in the user mode. Uh, we deprivilege our guest OS, we run the deprivileged guest OS in the uh, in the uh, higher ring in x86 specifically. Uh, every time there is an instruction, the host or the VMM will, will trap to that, will translate it, will execute that specific instruction and then go back to the user mode. So, uh, there will be a continuous context switching between the kernel mode and the user mode. The user mode for every instruction in the user mode, the kernel mode will um, have to uh, react to that. So, this is basically a method of interpretation. Uh, as it goes without saying, it is very expensive to do interpretation because uh, for every instruction, there is a uh, switch between the uh, two virtualization. In virtualization, emulation is not required. When the ISAs are different, uh, when we run two different ISAs, programs written for one ISA will be run in another ISA. There, the in every user instruction has to be trapped by the VMM and translated to the uh, target ISA. So, that will be required, but in this case, it is uh, really not required. A simpler mechanism, because in a virtualization, we uh, do not expect a different ISA. We expect the different OS, different operating system. So, operating system targeted for a specific ISA will uh, an application will run in that operating system, but this whole application and that operating system will be run on top of another operating system, but both will be targeted for the same ISA. So, we really do not need to uh, do an emulation. A simpler mechanism is called trap and emulate where uh, the, the guest environment application and the guest OS again will be run in the user mode. The guest OS will be deprivileged, VMM will run in the privileged mode. The normal instructions of the user process in the user mode will run directly just like a normal non-virtualized environment works. We will make it work in a similar manner. The user mode instructions will run in a uh, directly on the hardware, it will not require the intervention of the VMM. Um, only the privileged instructions that will be run by the uh, guest OS will be trapped to VMM and the VMM has to uh, take control of those instructions. So, uh, trap and emulate, uh, whenever VMM traps, it executes the necessary equivalent. Uh, in the underlying ISA uh, as is expected by the user and the uh, guest OS. And then 
it returns control to the uh, guest in the user mode. So, uh, the VMM runs in privileged mode every time there is a privileged instruction that traps to the VMM and uh, it works fine. User mode code runs at normal speed in the user uh, mode uh, all instructions are directly executed in the hardware and therefore, it runs in the normal speed. Uh, therefore, no, from the non virtualized environment there is no change, but kernel mode or the privileged code will be run at a slower speed because those have to be trapped and uh, emulated. Uh, but what happens now when there are several such guests available? Uh, each of these guests are trying to run privileged instructions and therefore, uh, so many uh, trap and emulate trap and emulate for each guest will definitely uh, become uh, more expensive. So, this is our, uh, our uh, trap and emulate mechanism where we have the VMM running at the uh, in the kernel mode and we have the user process and the guest OS running in the user mode. Uh, or normal user processes will execute only when the privileged instructions in the guest OS will be executed that will trap an emulation will be done um, and then the results will be returned to the uh, user. So, what to, what is the problem in this? There are certain ISAs like x86 which cannot be emulated we will shortly look into that. Uh, this is followed by Popek Goldberg uh, theorem. Uh, Intel x86 is uh, the example for it. Uh, let us look at this example. x86 has a POPF instruction uh, which uh, basically can run in both user mode as well as the privilege mode. So, it essentially does this, it essentially loads the uh, CPU flags from the uh, stack. So, in privileged mode all flags will be replaced, in user mode only some flags are replaced, but when this specific instruction is run in the user mode it does not generate a trap, it does not uh, trap to the operating system. So, the next uh, mechanism that we look at is a uh, binary translation in binary the binary translation solves this problem. So, some privileged instructions uh, run in both the modes in privilege mode as, as well as in uh, user mode. In user mode it behaves in a different way and in privilege mode it behaves in a different way is uh, that, that causes a lot of problems uh, like we saw and uh, this problem is resolved by binary translation. In binary translation uh, what we do is uh, the guest vCPU is run in the user mode as usual. If the guest vCPU is trying to run in the kernel mode that time VMM checks every instruction and uh, ensures that inspects all the instructions and ensures that the sensitive instructions are uh, trapped. So, translation happens it is not uh, emulation all instructions are not translated only the cur the guest OS's uh, sensitive instructions will be translated to something that will eventually trap will trap to the VMM when it is run. So, uh, VMM checks all the instructions non sensitive instructions are not uh, done anything only the sensitive instructions will be translated to an appropriate instruction according to the ISA. So, uh, performance will be worse than trap and emulate because uh, another layer of inspection is happening. All the normal instructions are going and executing, all the trappable instructions will be trapped by the uh, VMM anyway. In addition to that, we have a set of uh, sensitive instructions which are not privileged instructions by the ISA, we have to take care of this by the binary translation. So, therefore, the performance will definitely be worse, but there are uh, certain optimizations uh, that can be possible which is by caching the already translated set of instructions. Um, we translate a set of instructions and then 
store it in our cache and later on we try and uh, see whether it is already cached or not then no need to retranslate the same set of instructions if it comes back uh, we can use uh, the cached translation if it is not available then we translate. So, uh, this is our uh, binary translation where we have the VMM running in the uh, kernel mode and the guest OS and the user process application running in the user mode. Here, uh, we the VMM will check the uh, instructions, read the instructions. If it is a special instruction which is not going to trap normally, it will be uh, uh, it will be translated using the uh, the VMM and then it will be returned. So, uh, this is how a binary translation will work. Uh, let us now look at what actually happens in a uh, CPU virtualization, but before I go into CPU virtualization let me uh, just reiterate this that uh, HAL virtualization, hardware virtualization, machine level uh, virtualization and CPU virtualization are all bent uh, in a similar manner in our discussion. So, uh, as we saw from the our discussions we can uh, think of uh, four different types of methods. One is emulation where we saw interpretation, uh, one is uh, full virtualization uh, using uh, dynamic binary translation. We will mm, uh, see how we discussed, but we will see how binary dynamic translation works. Uh, and then we, we can have para virtualization and finally, we can have hardware assisted virtualization. These are four practical uh, methods of uh, working with virtualization. So, we start with the first technique which is emulation, uh, which uh, so we interpret the guest code and uh, only the uh, those hardware components uh, are emulated though that is not that is different from what is expected by the uh, by the incoming process. Therefore, CPU and memory are uh, sufficient to emulate. So, emulate the CPU, emulate the memory and uh, it can be done. Uh, however, we as we already seen performance will not be as good and therefore, it is not a preferred uh, method. Mm, uh, in case it is required some additional uh, mechanisms can be implemented. Now, let us look at what exactly we are uh, looking for. We want to run an existing operating system and application in an isolated virtual machine. So, we should be able to run many such uh, isolated uh, VMs and uh, there should be someone, some entity which will uh, supervise the whole process. So, uh, what can go wrong in this uh, scenario? What will make our uh, environment of uh, running isolated VMs with along with their uh, host operating system and the application on top of different operating system or a supervising operating system unsafe? Those instructions which will be executed by the uh, processor that will try to modify the state of the machine or it will behave uh, differently in two different modes as we saw in the pop f uh, example or it will fail silently in a certain mode. So, those are the instructions that are uh, unsafe. So, how do we ensure safety? We do by inspecting the code. Uh, we saw that in emulation we in have to inspect all the code rather than inspecting all the code in uh, binary translation uh, as we saw that method can be applied for uh, a virtualization uh, in practice and we can only inspect the important uh, instructions, rewrite the instructions which are uh, which may cause a problem. So, uh, what will happen to the performance? Of course, uh, the performance we in Popic Goldberg one of the uh, f the properties of a VMM is that the performance of a virtualized environment should be near native. 
how do we obtain that use in a practical environment? Uh, we make sure that most of or the bulk of the uh, instructions are executed in the na at in the native speed. Uh, we can do that by using what is known as full virtualization. Uh, here we apply the method of binary translation and trap and emulate and we call it a full virtualization. So, uh, in full virtualization uh, the guest operating sy systems uh, multiple uh, guest operating systems will uh, share the resources and hypervisor is not known to the uh, guest operating system. So, the guest operating systems are unaware of the presence of the uh, hypervisors. This uh, since it translates only the uh, privileged instructions the hardware uh, is uh, it is expected that the hardware should be a virtualizable hardware since the guest OS is accessing the uh, hardware is aware of the hardware. So, the guest OS is running and guest OS is expecting that it is running on top of the hardware without being aware of uh, changing the, uh, the privilege level. So, what happens when the uh, hardware is not virtualizable? We cannot do a full virtualization, just our x86 architecture is not virtualizable. So, therefore, after uh, the problems of Pope Goldberg came into light, for a very long time x86 was thought of uh, that cannot be virtualized. Uh, only when uh, the full virtualization came with a binary translation, then only we could understand that there is a, a possibility of uh, virtualizing x86. So, uh, in x86 if we want to virtualize, we need to run the guest OS in at a uh, higher uh, ring. We cannot run the uh, guest OS in the lower ring because we have the VMM. So, uh, we run the VMM in ring 0 and we run the guest OS either in ring 1 or in ring 3, in ring 3 along with the application or in uh, ring 1 uh, above the uh, privilege level ring 0. Uh, requirement that the guest OS should run at a higher uh, ring without knowing, without telling the guest OS that we are running you at a higher ring. Uh, creates uh, many problems. Uh, some of these are this uh, instructions, some sensitive instructions. We saw that that x86 not all uh, instructions are, uh, not all critical instructions are uh, privileged instructions. There are sensitive instructions which like POPF can run in both the modes and they cause lot of problems in the user mode uh, in the privilege mode and user mode, but they do not trap when run in the user mode. Uh, ring aliasing is the problem of running the OS at a different uh, ring level. What happens is since the operating system is expecting certain privileges when, uh, when they are written in to be run in ring 0, uh, easily the OS can find out that it is not running in the correct uh, ring and therefore, it does not behave properly. And the third problem is the address space. What happens to the address space uh, that is assigned to the operating system? Now, that address space is to be shared by the uh, virtual machine monitor or hypervisor as well as the guest OS. Therefore, guest OS does not get to access the complete address space as is expected. Again, when the guest OS is not expecting to be having uh, to have less privilege than it is written for, there will be uh, difficulties. So, uh, how do we resolve the problem of critical instructions, sensitive instructions uh, running in both the modes etcetera by doing a dynamic binary translation. So, we already saw what is a binary translation, I run the user mode code directly on the hardware, I trap only the uh, I translate only the critical instructions in the kernel uh, in the guest OS and make them trap to the VMM. 
that is a binary translation. These critical instructions will be converted to what is known as a privileged instruction. So, there is a sensitive set of sensitive instructions which will behave differently when they are running in user mode and kernel mode. When they are trying to run in the kernel mode, we translate them to a something that will be uh, always necessarily that will track to the VMM. Uh, this uh, when we done it in a dynamic manner, the translation the dynamic the binary translation is done in a dynamic manner, which means that we store we cache the translated uh, code, we take a basic block and we translate that block and when the next basic block comes we compare it with the uh, already cached uh, translated earlier blocks and if already a similar block is available we reuse them instead of translating everything. This is called a dynamic binary translation. So, we do a full virtualization using a binary dynamic binary translation. So, this is our uh, dynamic BT full virtualization. So, this is our host hardware. The VMM runs in ring 0, guest OS runs in ring 1, ring 2 is uh, empty does not have anything and ring 3 runs user applications. When the user executes an instruction, it can directly execute on the hardware without bothering about what is there in the in between layers. When it uh, in, uh, executes the uh, sensitive instruction, it traps to the OS. The OS will in turn be translated by the VMM in a dynamic binary translation and those codes will then be run on the host uh, by the VMM. This way a full virtualization using, using dynamic binary translation can be executed. So, what is the problem of this? Uh, the there is a hardware emulation for all those critical instru instructions therefore, that costs uh, performance uh, performance issue. There are certain cases where this binary translation does not work. If there is a self modifying code at runtime, the code is uh, changed by the um, operating system. So, therefore, uh, even if we do a translation an advanced translation of the code how the code is going to be modified is not known therefore, uh, nothing can be done. Uh, for self referencing code the references will change therefore, thereby causing a similar uh, problem of not knowing from before what code is going to be executed and for any real time system it is uh, very difficult because of the time uh, because of the performance issue. What is the solution if all largely full full virtualization with binary translation or dyna dynamic binary translation works, but there are certain cases where it does not work where we can use the next mechanism which is the para virtualization. Here rather than letting guest OS think that they are running at the highest privilege mode, uh, what the suggestion came is that why do not we modify the guest OS little bit to make it aware of that there is a VMM. So, in this case the guest OS will be communicating. So, the guest OS is aware of that there is someone I do not have the privileges. So, therefore, it will generate a call in turn which is uh, which will trap to the VMM itself. Zen uh, introduced this and largely and made it very popular. Uh, so, guest OS is modified and is run in either 1 or 3. Guest is fully aware of this, uh, the privilege instructions uh, no need for a translation of that. It will use uh, a hyper call, a special uh, call to trap to the uh, VMM, then VMM will execute. Thus, VMM is responsible for handling the virtualization fully. So, here also the user applications will directly execute their uh, code on the hardware. Here the guest OS will generate a hyper call and will uh, look at will go to the virtualization layer and virtualization layer will uh, translate. Now, what are the problems here? The guest OS is modified. So, therefore, that causes a lot of problems in the guest OS. 
uh, we need a tight coupling between the gateways and the hypervisor hence compatibility will become an issue and uh, every time there is a change in the hypervisor all the guest operating systems have to be recompiled. Now, uh, so many problems and difficulties in making changes in the uh, operating system and the ISAs uh, can be resolved by the manufacturer themselves. So, uh, some instructions may be redefined, the uh, ring can be readjusted so that the these problems of critical instruction not trapping as we faced in the full uh, translation, uh, full uh, virtualization is not uh, there. So, uh, all these software changes, modern x86 uh, architecture uh, as Intel has come up with meets the Pope Goldberg requirement. This is VTX, Intel VTX and AMD V are two uh, hardware, two ISAs which meet the uh, requirements. This VTX uh, introduces the uh, two modes, one is the VMX root mode and the other is the VMX non root mode. The VMX root mode runs the VMM, non root mode runs the guest operating system. Uh, both of them supports all the four uh, rings and uh, in uh, the guest need not be modified like para virtualization, they can be run as it is, but they are running in non root mode. Every time they run a privilege instruction rather than directly accessing the hardware, they trap to the uh, root mode and the uh, VMM takes over the control. So, this is the non root and this is the root, there is no essentially looking at it, there is no difference, but every time the non root tries to execute something, it traps to the uh, root mode. So, what are the challenges? The mod, the guest OS is unmodified, so all legacy OSs can be uh, allowed, but the since the unmodified guest does not know about the virtualization, so the advantage of virtualization is not uh, taken. This can be resolved by running a para virtualization also. So, this is the summary of CPU virtualization that uh, we looked at emulation, we looked at the uh, modern uh, virtualization techniques and uh, we looked at the hardware uh, assistance of Intel VTS, VTX approach. Uh, let us look at Zen which is a case study of para virtualization. Uh, this is the, the name is next generation that is how the Zen has been coined. It is a virtualization system uses para virtualization. These are the virtual machines they are called domain or DOM. The DOM 0 is the uh, main domain and there are DOM U's which can run different uh, types of uh, guest OSs. So, uh, hypervisor is the main component and in DOM 0, there are domains DOM 0 and DOM U. Uh, in DOM 0, uh, it is a modified Linux kernel and this is the main uh, virtual machine. We, this has uh, special rights and can access the uh, physical resources through uh, the VMM. Uh, it interacts with all other virtual machines and DOM U will be the other all other virtualized operating systems that will be run and there is a para virtualized VM which is the DOM U PV guests uh, which can run Linux, Solaris, etc. and a full virtualized uh, VM which is the DOM U 8 VM uh, guest which can run unmodified operating systems like Windows. So, uh, what is the, uh, the Zen uh, pro project has been uh, very popular and it uh, has been taken over by many uh, companies, uh, Sun Microsystem, HP, Novel, Red Hat, they all have uh, different uh, ways of adapting Zen to their uh, uh, work uh, including IBM. So, uh, we come to the end of this module and we come to the end of virtualization. Uh, we looked at in this module the different methods of virtualization, the three types and then we saw how uh, CPU virtualization is, is implemented using the three methods and then we looked at how Zen works. 
Uh, now that we come to the end of virtualization, we talk about the next uh, mechanism or technique on which cloud depends, which is the web services. Uh, these are our references. Thank you.